Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My camera fell off the grip that it was on for probably the last two and a half years and uh, now I went ahead and moved it, which is why you can see this absolutely brand new stunning angle of me. Please don't dox me based on the ever so slightly additional information you see in the back of my apartment. Today we are going to be talking about how to build Facebook Messenger, which is a very big skill every single software engineer should have because it makes you three times as effective in the DM. For me personally, that went from 0% success rate to 0% success rate, but uh, my point still holds true. Let's go ahead and get into it. Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp are both real-time instant messaging platforms. When a user sends a message to a chat, all users in the chat should see it. Messages in each chat should be deterministically ordered. We also expect that message delivery should take only a couple of seconds. Group chats are also on the table. For example, I have a group chat with myself and all the MILFs within a 10 mile radius of me. Let's formalize our requirements here. Users should be able to create chats, add members to a chat, remove members from a chat, and send messages to a chat. In addition, they should receive messages for all chats that they're members of. If for some reason their device was offline, they should receive their missed messages when they come back online. In my case, for example, I turned off my phone for an hour and came back to a thousand messages from Corinna Cop begging for my bathwater. Let's estimate that we have a billion users sending a hundred billion messages per day. This equates to a bit over one million messages per second. Another practical limit that both Messenger and WhatsApp enforce is on group chat size, which they keep to around 500. Finally, let's assume we have 10 billion total group chats, each with 10 users on average. Let's consider how we'll represent a group chat. At a high level, it's just a set of users. If we choose to take a normalized database approach, this chat members table has a very simple schema of chat ID and user ID, where there can be many rows per chat ID. An individual chat will just have two users in it. Adding a user to a chat just requires adding their row here, and removing them from it is the opposite. Recall from our capacity slide, we have 10 billion group chats with on average 10 users each. Since each user ID and chat ID can be stored with eight bytes, each data row is 16 bytes and there should be 100 billion rows. It costs us 1.6 terabytes to store this table. Next, we can consider how we want to represent messages. Each message has a sender ID, a chat ID, a server sign timestamp, and a message payload. There's probably also some metadata too about where the message was sent from. In total, let's imagine this comes out to about 200 bytes. We need to add 20 terabytes of data per day just to accommodate 100 billion messages. Every messenger user needs to receive messages from all of the group chats that they're in. In the past, I've suggested that we may want to do this with a real-time push technology from a server to the client. Options here are things like WebSockets or server send events. One possibility here would be users connected to many application servers, so as the users receive incoming messages, they can forward them to all interested parties. However, this is not a good idea. Since a user can be in a bunch of different chats, they'd potentially have to maintain many simultaneous server connections, which is expensive for the device. It would be a lot better if each user just maintained a connection to a single server at a time to receive messages. In the diagram on screen, client devices now have to publish messages to many different servers. We don't want that either, as it puts a ton of load on the sender device to publish so many API requests for large group chats. Another option would be to have the servers perform the message routing. In this case, we have two options. We could return an acknowledgement back to the sender after server two receives the message, or we could return it after both receivers have gotten the message. In the first case, we're still prone to failures after reporting a success to our sender. If that happens, either one or both of the receivers may never get the message. In the second case, we'll take a long time to return a success to the sender, which is a bad user experience. We want to be able to quickly report a success message to the sender, but then asynchronously ensure that all interested parties eventually receive the message. For this to happen, the sender needs to publish the message to a durable location. For example, we can persist our message to Kafka and return a successful result to the sender as soon as it gets there. However, there are still complications here. What if one of the receiver devices is offline? It needs to get its missed messages when it comes back up. To facilitate this, we can just sync this message to our messages table. When the receiver comes back up, it can pull messages that it missed from the messages database. Oh wait, this database is actually huge and we're adding 20 terabytes per day. How can we partition it so that our message receiver only has to fetch missed messages from one shard? To be honest, there's not really a good way of doing it. Because many people are in each group chat and all users are in a bunch of different group chats, we can't send each message to just one shard so that all reads are super efficient. After horizontally scaling our table, these missed message queries become massive scatter gather queries and are bottlenecked by the latency of the slowest shard. We don't want that. 
To speed this up, we need to put all messages that a given user is interested in onto the same shard. We can accomplish this with fanout. This should start to look really similar to our newsfeed problem from last episode. Now, when a user wants to fetch their historic messages after coming back online, they can just pull the database for messages since the timestamp of the one they last received. Up to this point, we've totally glossed over how we actually route messages to a given user. Since we have all these servers actively maintaining connections to users, we'd need to keep a mapping of that somewhere. Every time one of these servers goes down, or one of these clients disconnects and reconnects to a different server, we'd need to take note of this. That's actually kind of a pain in the ass, much like my ex-girlfriend. We now have two different flows for live messages and historic messages, and they don't really work all that well with one another. Actually, we already have a component that gracefully handles mapping users to a single node in a fault-tolerant manner. That is the distributed database. Instead of relying on client devices maintaining a persistent connection to a server, they can just pull their shard of the database on an interval. I'll call the table containing the inbox of messages for each user the user messages table. One thing to note is we probably only want this user messages table to hold recently received messages per user. Otherwise, it's going to really balloon in size. We should probably have a separate messages table, which is going to be our source of truth. To accomplish this, we can first write to the messages table. From there, we can use change data capture to pipe these incoming changes into Kafka. This helps us avoid partial failure scenarios where only one of the messages database or Kafka receives the incoming payload. Let's talk more about our user messages table. Simply put, this one is going to store the messages of all the group chats that a user is in. We can cap the size for each user by running an occasional query to clean all but the last few messages in each group chat. From there, if a user is scrolling up very far in a particular chat to get historic messages, they can just access those from the normal messages table. We can partition that one by chat ID so that accessing messages for a single chat is speedy. We'll partition our user messages table by the receiving user ID so that all messages in a user's inbox are on the same shard. The first thing that we want to ensure for this table is that message insertions to this table are idempotent. We can guarantee this by using the message's unique ID as our sort key. That being said, we also want to allow clients to very quickly fetch all the messages since the last one that they've read. If a client device caches the latest timestamp across all received messages, they can ask the database for messages since then. We can accomplish our goal here by adding a local secondary index on the timestamp that the database received the message. Notice how I'm using the database receive timestamp as opposed to the message creation timestamp. This is because we're receiving messages from many different servers and many different chats, so they may not come in proper order of message creation timestamp. Then, when polling, we'd permanently miss querying late arriving messages. Since this is just a local index, it isn't very expensive to maintain it. At its core, this problem is almost identical to the newsfeed problem. I'll quickly draw out some parallels. Submitting a message is very similar to creating a tweet. We want to be able to fetch messages by chat ID, so we'll first persist the message to a messages table that is sharded accordingly. Similarly, being in a group chat is almost comparable to following the tweets of all the group chat members. To add someone to the group chat, we'll just add a row to the chat members table. The next aspect of the problem that we'll cover here builds upon the deep dive section in our prior video. We know that when a message comes in, we need to fan it out to the one database row per group chat member. In order to do so, we can use change data capture. This will allow us to take all incoming messages and place them into a Kafka stream. This can be done pretty easily with Debezium. Recall that we're persisting 1 million messages per second, each of which is 200 bytes in size. To persist 200 megabytes per second of messages here, we'll certainly need a few partitions of the change data capture topic for our messages table. When a Kafka consumer receives the message, it must first figure out all the users in the group chat. In theory, fetching this from the chat members database isn't too expensive, though it does add yet another network hop to our critical path of handling messages. Instead, we could actually pre-cache the members of all group chats in each consumer. We can do this by subscribing to a change data capture feed from our chat members table. However, the full size of the chat members table is over a terabyte. What if we don't want to cache that whole thing? What we can do instead is use a co-partition join. This way, the Kafka consumer that handles all messages for a subset of chats will only cache the chat members for that subset. We can do this by partitioning our chat members and messages change data feeds by the chat ID. As long as both of these topics have the same number of partitions, a consumer that subscribes to the corresponding partitions of both topics will handle all the data for the same subset of chats. A tool that can help us do this fairly easily is Kafka Streams. Like Kafka consumer groups, Kafka streams can support at least once processing across many different consumer nodes. 
It also makes sure that we can easily recover any cache state in the event of a component failure. In our case, we've been caching the mapping of each chat ID to the users in it. If a consumer fails, we'd like to be able to easily recover that state on another node. After our Kafka consumers figure out which users are in this chat, they can write a database row for every single receiving user. In our case, we want to ensure that these writes are parallelized as much as possible in order to achieve maximum throughput. A user's device can now pull for unread chat messages. Even though the messages are coming in a different order than they'll be displayed on the client device, there shouldn't be too many of them at a time, and we can just sort them accordingly, either on the server or on the client device itself. As a user scrolls up in history in a particular chat, they'll need to fetch more messages. They can do so by just hitting the normal messages table. Since chats are limited in their number of members, we shouldn't have to worry about hotspots when reading or writing to this table. If any of the prior information didn't make sense here, I'd highly encourage watching the newsfeed videos over the last two weeks. Anyways, let's move on to today's deep dive. This is mainly going to center around a race condition to do with change data capture. We'll also have a small section on using our database to provide timestamps for ordering messages in the user messages table. Let's imagine I'm in a group chat with someone I don't like for example, Donald Trump, and I want to say something mean about him. I remove him, and I send a message commenting on his small hands. What could happen is that my message gets to the Kafka consumer before the fact that I remove Donald from the chat. In this case, he'll actually see my message. Let's talk about how we can prevent this. We know that the unfollow occurs before the chat message. Since they're both sent from the same client, the client itself can actually write the timestamp of the unfollow operation into the message itself. In our stream consumer, we can actually check the maximum update timestamp that we've seen associated with the chat members. If it's not sufficiently up to date with the timestamp in the message, then we need to pull the database for conclusive results. Notably, this type of thing does not work if you just have Messenger open on your phone and laptop and do the operations on different devices. There's simply no way to coordinate them. That being said, if we did have some way of giving an accurate timestamp to every single database write, regardless of the client that it comes from, we could do a similar process like we did above by checking that our chat member's information is as up to date as our message creation timestamp. This is because we know our message creation timestamp is greater than the unfollow operation timestamp. This is actually the concept behind Google Zanzibar. They use Google TrueTime to assign every event a globally linearizable timestamp. That way, for an incoming event, they can check for all known security permissions created before its timestamp. Let's now talk a little bit more about our design, which uses database assigned timestamps. Recall that in our user messages table, a user needs to be able to efficiently query for unseen messages. We accomplish this by using the timestamp that the database received each message, since it is strictly increasing. However, this assumption isn't fully true. If the node that's assigning our timestamps goes down, and the new node assigning timestamps has a clock that is behind the original, it may assign too old a timestamp to some incoming messages. When the client pulls, it won't look back far enough in order to see those new messages. As far as I can tell, there are a couple of solutions here. On the failover, the new leader could wait until its local clock time surpasses that of its latest seen message. This could potentially result in longer failover times. Another solution here would be to keep track of the database timestamp and the identity of the node that assigned them. In that case, if a new leader pops up, we'll realize that we have to start querying its timestamps from the beginning of time and keep track of a max timestamp for all leaders on the client. Well guys, I certainly hope that you enjoyed this video. It was definitely a fun one for me to make. Um, I think if people watch this in isolation, a lot of you guys might not love it very much because Frankly, it's quite confusing. Like I've said a lot here that makes many assumptions that you've been watching these videos sequentially, and uh, I hope people are actually doing that. Like, I'm really gonna keep this 3.0 series to probably like 10 to maybe 15 videos at most, and my hope is that you know just by covering all the super popular design patterns, we can actually build up in a way that you know it helps to watch the prior video before going on to the next one. Because otherwise, I'm just covering a bunch of redundant stuff. Like. This problem is very, very similar to the newsfeed, but kind of the main value of doing a problem like this is pattern recognition of being like, oh, wait a second, this is yet another fan out problem. This one, the notification service, there are a few of them like this. Uh, if you can recognize them as you're going through it in an interview, then you can come up with a solution really, really quickly. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm looking forward to the next one.